The following <coughs> interview was conducted with Mary Beth Schmidt, uh, Jean Edmondson Stanley Faculty Chair in, liter in Literacy for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, June 10, 2011, Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Good afternoon, Beth Good Schmidt. Afternoon. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you for asking me. Tell us a little bit about where and when you were born and your parents in early years. Well, actually, I was born in Greenville, South Carolina, and lived there until I was three years old. And at that time, our family moved to Dallas, Texas. Okay. And we lived there until I was 10 years old in the fourth grade. So I was really a southern child. <laughs> um, and when I was 10, we moved here to Lafayette. So I've been in this area since I was 10 years old. I come from a large Catholic family, uh, six children, four, boy, four girls, two boys, and our family is still very close. We've lost our mother and father, but uh, my siblings and their spouses uh, and I all get together once a week for dinner, which is do An they all live in the, in the community? In Only the one is not in okay. town, so it's very nice. So now did you go to grade school here in high school? Uh, yes, okay. I went to St. Mary's Elementary School okay. and Tecumseh Junior High School and Lafayette Jeff. Okay. Yes, and then I did all three of my um, academic degrees from Purdue. I don't know if you knew that I or not, that. but I, I have. But let's talk a little about yeah. high school. Any clubs or organizations? Tell a little about anything was there a special program that you took when some people take college prep or just a general um i was in were you at the old jeff or the new jeff i was at the old jeff okay yeah okay. that tells you how old i am no 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 no, no. <laughs> I, I, I was, was at the old jeff and yeah. that was back when um there were not athletics for girls pretty much you know um it was mostly um was it phys ed you probably had to take some phys ed i had to absolutely do that school, yeah. yes yes but it was fun to be part of uh, being a, you know, having the great basketball school, the football team, the basketball team, and those are the things I remember um, being in the block section and doing those sorts of things. I, I sang in the a cappella choir and was in some uh, performances, uh, musical performances that we did. So Very nice. that was my. Where did they? Where did they? Uh, did they play the basketball right there at the school? No, the school for the research was located on 9th, 9th Street. It was on right? 9th Street, and right, that's okay. that's did, where they played the basketball. But now, where where would they play football? The football was up at the corner of 18th and, and Union. 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 Yes, that, which, I yeah. Now I remember. Yeah, I'm not right. even sure if that is there right. anymore, but that was our football. Right, and they field got at some the office buildings or something there now. Yes. Oh, good. Yeah. Did yeah. you live uh, fairly close to the high school? Uh, yes, we lived in Highland Park. Okay. So it was. It was, it was pretty close. Yeah. Right. Okay. How did you happen to select Purdue? Well, that's interesting. Um, I really didn't want to go to Purdue because it was just the you know, across the street. Across the street, and it wasn't really a very attractive campus in the 1960s. But my father said, um, "Yes, that." You will go to Purdue because that that's, <laughs> that's the university been. right across the the river. And I didn't realize until later what an extraordinary opportunity it was to go to really a world class university. Right. And but when it's in your own town you do not realize that. I understand. Yes. Well, now did you live on campus? The first year I did. Okay. I I saved my um, babysitting money and so forth, and I, I paid to live in the dorm my okay. first year. What, what so I you? lived in Warren Hall, All right. okay. over in the, the old dorms. Then um, I pledged a sorority, the okay. Chi Omega, and so the second year I stayed both at home and at the sorority house. Um, you like being yeah. in the sorority. It, was kind of, it gives a different dimension. It did, right. yeah. That, yeah. And that was a nice way for um, since you live right here in town, yeah. being able to be at the sorority house really, it made you feel like you were a part of the campus. Right, and also yeah. you, there were other people from outside the United, from outside Lafayette that you got that were members. Absolutely, of, yes. Right. That yeah. ended up being something that I carried on into my adult life. I, I worked as um, 
uh, officers in the Chi Omega Alumni Association okay. and so forth, you know, so, so that ended up being yeah. a, did, a valuable. Did you go to the uh, football games when you were a student at Purdue? Yes, basketball? I did. Yeah. That's kind of nice. You were yeah. close, too. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, now, after, after you graduated, what was your course, uh, what did you major in when you were at Purdue? Um, I majored in French education. My plans at the time was to be, sure. you know, my plans were um, to become a French teacher. But um, I was, my husband and I, who we met in high school, we were high school sweethearts, uh, we ended up... Um, Did he being, come to Purdue as well? No, he oh. was, went to Notre Dame. Okay. And so um, I was geographically tied to this area sure. once we were you know, married young and living here, and I was never able to find a job as a French teacher. So I was able to get a position in a Catholic elementary school teaching fourth grade. Nice. And that's how I became interested in literacy. So it's, it shifted away from French education sure. to elementary education and then did Focus you teach at a literacy. school here in town? Yes, oh, okay. I taught at St. Lawrence Elementary, okay. and I taught at St. Mary's. Okay. Yes. Um, I gather your husband had was. Some, you both lived here after you got married, in um, Lafayette. Yes. Okay. Well, we were married while he was still at, at Notre, Notre Dame. Dame. Okay. So, um, I actually was a college dropout for a little bit. We, okay. <laughs> we, well, I, uh, we went and lived up in South Bend for okay. his senior year. And after that, we moved to Indianapolis. He got a job there, but we were only there for a year. But I started back to work, or back to school mm -hmm. in Indianapolis at IUPUI. Good. And then, once, so actually I was only out of school for a year when all was said and done. So, and then we moved back to Lafayette, okay. and um, I was able to finished my schooling um, just a year behind I would have so uh, That's that not yeah that that ended up but um, that's how I ended up getting involved in literacy was okay. just you know well, then you know. then you went on for the graduates and what came next after that um, well as I was teaching at st. Mary's I was doing work with struggling readers then so when I decided to get my master's degree, I decided to focus on literacy. And that was something that I did over a period of time while I was still teaching. But I was invited to teach a graduate class, you know, to serve as a grad instructor. So that gave me the opportunity to teach college students, which got me interested in the idea of teaching pre-service teachers. And I finally decided that I would um, quit my job at St. Mary's and go to school full time yeah. to get the doctorate. Yeah. And let yeah. me ask you this: What, when you're talking about the children, were they had struggled to read? They hadn't done much reading when they were young, or what? Did you well? There was a, a really a variety okay. of things because I was working with children at all different grade levels this is at, at the time at St. Mary's. Okay. Yes, uh -huh. so I, I wasn't. Um, Did I, I couldn't really say that there was one specific thing. Right. Okay, uh, students can come in from generally at St. Mary's. They were coming from homes where there were books, sure. but sometimes they just need. A little bit of extra one-on-one right. -on -one right. attention or small group work. Right, exactly. Or and you notice that too. Yes. Uh -huh. And I, you know, I was interested to see one of those displays they had for that home. It was Curious George, and they had Curious George in the library. That's a title I had not heard of, but I know the book <laughs> Curious George. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> then, uh, so, so you continued on as a full-time grad student. Is that what right? You became next? Yes. Okay. So I, I became a full-time grad student and really focused and was able to complete my uh, doctoral degree in three years by really focusing on that. Right. <clears throat> and I uh, believe I earned that degree in 1987 okay. and uh, searched for a job and found a position at DePaul University. So we still lived in Lafayette, but for five years I 
commuted, uh, commuted to DePauw. Yeah. How did you, did, what sort of position were you doing teaching there? Or um, yes, I was teaching literacy courses, you know, and it's a very small university. I went there one time yeah. for a meeting, and it's a lovely campus, and oh, it was a it nice, very it was a, nice, it's an easy drive, so I yes. can see your point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. The students, uh, the classes were small. We were also their academic advisor, so we got to know the students really Pretty well. Sure. And it was a great experience. Yeah. yeah, okay. And then from there, was that how you happened to come to Purdue? Yes, how actually, the College of Ed, what, well, it was a school of education then. At and Purdue? At Purdue. Okay. It, it was, um, they had just broken away from the School of Humanities, Social Science, and Education, and they became the School of Education. This is what I was teaching at DePauw. And someone, Marilyn Herring was the dean, and an alum had suggested to them in, in some strategic planning meeting that it would be good for the, the school to become a university training center for reading recovery. And they called me up and asked if I would come back to Purdue and get this program started for the state of Indiana. And, you know, that was um, a, an interesting decision to have to make because I, I was really very happy teaching at DePaul, but this was a, an opportunity to come back to my alma mater, basically, and to get involved in a program that um, I didn't know it at the time, but it was going to have a tremendous impact on my life and then the lives of lots of teachers and sure. children in the state. So it was basically an invitation to come back. Yeah. And, and it worked out nicely. It did. It worked out nicely. That yeah. was... Then move on. Tell us a little bit about that in your own words, the Reading Recovery, the Training Center and all of that, the center, et cetera. Well, the way Reading Recovery operates is that there's a, a university training center that has um, a professor who serves as the trainer. And that person, in order to set up the center, has to go through a year-long training program. So I had to go to the University of Illinois for a year to be trained to be, be trained trainer. to be the trainer and to set up this center. So that was um, interesting. Yeah, I mean, it it was something. Um, that's what made the decision sort of difficult. You know, it was, well, we would like you to come back to Purdue and get this program started, but by the way, you will have to, you know. There are some requirements. Yeah, you'll year. have to leave for a year. So, um, but after that year, then. Did you stay over there and they just come home on the weekends? Or? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. That's so, right. Oh, yeah. It was interesting. You know, my husband and I had been married right out of, uh, well, you know, we were still college students when we got married, and we neither one of us had ever lived apart. So that was a, an interesting <laughs> personal imagine. and professional experience. Yeah, sure. uh, but I got the opportunity then to really be a leader in the state in terms of getting this program started. I gather that one had been, was going for some time, the Illinois in, at Illinois? Um, yes, or, there okay. were, um, I believe, around that time, I think there were 15 universities across the state stuff. that there were only two places where you could train as a trainer, which is what I did. Yeah. And, and there were 15 universities where um, teachers could go to train as teacher leaders. So it's a three-tiered program. There's the university trainer, and that person, which is what I became, uh, trains teacher leaders who are teachers who already have master's degrees and they would come and go through a year-long training program and then return to their area and train other teachers. Mm -hmm. So there's a trainer who trains teacher leaders and the teacher leaders train the teachers. I'm sorry. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, over time, um, we were able to set up t about 26 training sites around the state where teacher leaders who had trained here were training teachers in their districts. So see how it grows right. exponentially right. like that. So, um, and did you do some traveling? Uh, were you, you, were, you were the head 
chief honcho for the whole thing and you did yes. you travel to the various locations or yes I did okay. as once the teacher leaders came here for their year then the following year I would go to twice to their training sites and visit them mentor sure. them sure. Um, okay. support them basically so each year I was not only training a new group of teacher leaders but I was going out and visiting the teacher leaders who had already trained right. and did you do they all would the also training yourself here I mean or did somebody else help you with it or? Um, no I did um, most of the train I mean I was in charge of the program sure. and the first year I trained a teacher leader Tammy Yance, who ended up staying and doing a lot of the work with me. I mean, she she was a very skilled teacher leader. And um, but as far as being the trainer, I remained the the one university trainer at a couple of different times over the years. We had other trainers who were here for a couple of years at a time, yeah. but for the most part. I was wow. the one who ran the Isn't center. That great? How it's grown? Well, it has, uh, and I, I think that probably more than sixty thousand children have have gone through the program over time, and so many teachers have been trained. But the problem is that with budgets being so tight, that schools aren't being able to support it as much as they were before so um, un, you know unfortunately it's it's right. you know not nearly as big as it used to be right. what but level are you are you, are you were you working with the students in the grade school level or well yeah? uh, or reading recovery is a first grade program okay because the first the graders I, only okay. first graders only and the okay. idea uh, the woman who designed it was from New Zealand okay. and and her idea was that a child should go through one year of schooling to see how things go. And at the end of a year, teachers are able to tell which students are struggling, yeah. yet the students don't quite know yet that they're struggling, and they, they will not have um, habituated a lot of inappropriate um, strategies and so forth so after one year of schooling is the best time to catch them so it remained a first grade right program now are there also schools in Lafayette that offer that to have that program as well um, right now only uh, Cumberland School okay. in West Lafayette okay. is doing okay. the reading recovery now, part but of Klondike had had done it right. and, yeah now the the literacy collaborative which was launched is that something that something additional or something new that was something additional okay. when administrators were very pleased about um, the good work that we were doing in reading recovery with the struggling learners so they said is there something that you could do that would help with the entire classroom so Marilyn Herring was still the dean and I went to her and you know told her about this and um, so she told me to go ahead and investigate you know is there something else that we could do so I visited uh, Ohio State and Texas Tech both of those universities had this program called literacy collaborative which is a classroom professional development program and it was designed by uh, two reading recovery trainers so there was a nice uh, fit it was based on the same theoretical foundations of reading recovery so um, I was able to get some funding from uh, the Indiana Department of Education with some funding you know the funding that had come through the General Assembly mm -hmm. and uh, we hired uh, Dr. Sarah Mayhurt who came and she went through the training to do literacy collaborative so what was happening then is our project was no longer just reading recovery it became more of a comprehensive it broadens, um, right, right right then when George Hind came to be the dean he encouraged us to uh, apply to become an official university center you know now that we had this 
comprehensive professional development program going on. So, um, what, we, what did the, that entail in order to get that? Well, it, it was a matter of writing a proposal, um, creating a, a strong um, design for how the center would operate. Sure. And um, so that's when we became the Center for Literacy, Education, and Research. Yeah, that's at that really time, nice. yeah. And how did the, and you got that, your distinct, the, the special professorship, which is really nice. How did that come about? And well, re, how did you find out about it? Well, that's, again, that was when George Hind was the dean. And that's very nice. It, it, it was really an amazing thing to happen in my professional life. He was very, um, proud of the center. I mean, that's what he wanted us to become an official center so that we that could get more us. exposure. And he was working with, you know, with the development office and working with the Dollins family. And then it was a surprise to me for him to put forth, um, you know, it had to go. All, all the way through up to the board of trustees and so forth for me to be approved to um, be named to that faculty chair. But that was a very, very, uh, very special. Yeah, it was yeah. very special. The Dollins family is just wonderful. They were honoring Susie Dollins was honoring her mother. That's where the name. Okay, I was going to ask you. Yeah, yeah. That's where the name comes from. So um, I was. Are very they, honored to have they, that. Are they still special. alive? Are you in touch yes. with them? Yes. Okay. Do, where do they live? They live in Indianapolis. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. So. That's very nice. Yeah. Ah. Um, your publication, one comment on that, Changing Futures, the Influence of Reading Recovery in the United States. It's a key, one, a key book. Uh, yes, it really was. Um, we wanted to write some, there were uh, five of us trainers from different universities and we wanted to create you know it didn't start out to be a book it it was sure. you know <laughs> going to be a paper or, or a, or a chapter or a mon exactly but we wanted to have something where everybody would understand the theoretical underpinnings of reading recovery um, how advocacy worked and how uh, how it's implemented in schools, how it's cost effective. So um, I ended up being the uh, first author on it, meaning that you know we all shared in writing the different chapters, and I I was I got a lot of editing experience doing that okay. book, but um, that that was a really um, very. Well, I don't know how to describe it. It it was a good way to let everybody know about it, all in one place. You know, to to have all that information. And I think the it title up is a lot of eyes for people. It now did. Like it did. And the title was really special because it meant that changing futures. We're not only changing the futures of the children when you think about it, because we really do. They're on a path struggling, and we change that path. But teachers are really changed as well, and schools are changed. Right. There's a big, a large body of changes. Exactly, exactly. So right. it was, it was a well, very... Um, well recognized and well done, and you should feel yeah. proud of it. Thank you. Thank My you pleasure. very much. Uh, the uh, reading teacher and the editorial review board for uh, researchers just tell about that particular publication. Well, um, I had served um, on the editorial board of the reading teacher, which means articles are sent. That's been and published for a long time. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I remember yeah. the title yeah. of that. Uh -huh. That's yeah. been around for Are a you long still on time. The board uh, not right now. Oh, no, okay. no. Okay. Um, I am very often. Um, our uh, editors will send publications to me that, um, or I'll serve as the guest editor of, sure. of a different, uh, you know, a journal here or there, uh, if it relates to the topic of metacognition, because that's something that I. That's another uh, area. Yes. Uh -huh. Right. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. So. 
that. Um, Department of uh, Curriculum Instruction Assistant Head, can you make a couple comments on that? Well, uh, that was when Jim Lehman was the, uh, let's see, I think it's when he took over as department head. Okay. And he asked if I would serve as his assistant head. And um, he had all of the big responsibilities. <laughs> you I, 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 uh, one of the main things that I did was help with the uh, doing the merit reviews for faculty. You know, everybody turns in their yeah. their documents um, and signed off on things when he wasn't around. But you know, when I, but you still were in charge of the center. I mean, at the same time, absolutely. Okay. Yes, it it was it was just. Was a nice an change. added an added thing. Yes, yeah. It was another way to uh, be part of the faculty. And, sure. Yeah. Right. Uh, committees. Any school or university committees that you served on that you make a comment on? Department or college? Um, I don't think that. Let's okay. see. I was a, a chair of element or co-chair of elementary education okay. for one year. Um, of course. I serve on the primary committee. Right. Um, every once in a while, I end up on the grievance committee. Um, Some other university the, committee. That yes, uh -huh. right. yes, we all do. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, family. Talk about that. Well, uh, my husband and I have one son who's in his thirties now. So, did he go? Did he come to Purdue? Um, he did. He went to DePaul and to Purdue. Okay. So. And uh, what's he, where's he residing? What does he do? He lives in Lafayette, okay. um, and he has a variety of jobs. Uh, he has his own DJ business where he DJs at weddings and things like that. Sounds good. He's the varsity tennis coach at Central Catholic, and he uh, plays in a band. You know, he, he just has good. a lot of different lots of activities. Lot, yes, a lot of different activities. Them. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. We talked about awards and honors by any, about the chair, but you also got the Outstanding Engagement Award from the Department of Curriculum Instruction. That's very nice. Um, ask you a little bit about the Indiana State Reading Association Celebrate Literacy Award. Did you take a um, on that? Uh, yes, that was a very nice surprise. Okay. That was early in my career mm -hmm. in um, leading reading recovery for the state. And uh, I think an administrator at one of the schools put me up for that award. And so that was very nice because uh, how they explained it was that I was having an impact statewide on, on students and teachers across the state. So that right. was That's nice. That was and, nice. And uh, would you comment on the Indiana General Assembly, that resolution, the concurrent? Oh, that was an amazing surprise. And State Representative Sheila Klinker okay. had something to do with that. Okay. Again, it had to do with the impact that I was having on children's lives. Not only um, reading recovery, but by expanding the center to be a more sure. comprehensive program, then, you know, we were touching the lives of um, all students in schools, and so um, she, oh, ha whatever it is that she has to do, but but she arranged for the resolution. And yes, I I was there. And how did they get you there? Did you know what was coming? Uh, I did know that oh. it was coming, and um, <laughs> it it was very. Um, it was exciting to be standing up in front of while they're reading the, right while they're reading um, the list of, of accomplishments and so forth. And That's very nice. So yeah, you yeah. sort of have to be real. You know, oh my God, have to really realize. behave yourself. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Professional associations, the National Reading Conference, you uh, student outstanding research award. You were the chair of that committee. At one time, uh, you, yes, I did. I served on that committee as chair for, gosh, several years. But when I was a student, I won the award. Very so, nice. um, 
That's I mean, right. I just, and then be chairing on the committee. Which right, yeah. yeah. That. And then you were president and also been active in the Reading Recovery Council of North America. You might make a comment for the researchers what that council is comprised well, of. Well, the you know, as, as I told you, there were these various universities yeah, where right. each one had a trainer, right. or, or some of them had more than one trainer. And we were trying to run Reading Recovery for the country. And it was obvious that we needed to have an organization um, that could cre create advocacy, um, publications. For We, we wanted Worth to have a... all of the units within it, it. Exactly, right. Um, we, we needed to have an organization that could create uh, what would, benefits, I guess sure. you would call it, for... Um, these for all the teachers across the country. That are part yes. of the program. Yes, and exactly. so we created this um, membership organization, and um, you know hired a, a group to run it. And so the university trainers had all this input and served sure. on all these committees and so forth. Um, but it became a really an incredible ten thousand member organization. It was just phenomenal. Was it just the yeah. U.S. or was it? Did you make it international? Um, it was uh, North America. North America. Okay. Yes, North America. So I, I was involved in that organization from the very beginning. I was involved in uh, writing the, you know, the very first strategic plan, mission and vision, and right. so forth, the and formation and, and all that goes. Through. Right, and I was on um, on the executive board as uh, secretary for several years, and then I was elected vice president, which then it puts you in that role of vice president, then president, president-elect, and you know. So I served, I think, Some eight years. years or so <laughs> um, on the, the Reading Recovery Council. And we put on a national conference each year. Um, so are you, still, that, are you still active in Yes, uh -huh. that's good. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Did you ever have a meeting at Purdue? The uh, meeting at, at Purdue, the council didn't meet. No, at, they oh. always met at over at Ohio State. Oh, okay. Actually, reading recovery started in the U.S. at Ohio State University, so everything has always been sort of, revolves sort of around, yeah. yeah, it revolves <laughs> They're not around. Not going to trade, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. They they wouldn't want to give that up. No. Um, hobbies, special interests, any. Would I love to read. Good. Okay. <laughs> I absolutely love to read, and now I have the Kindle, which is so easy to carry around. How do you like that? I really like it. Yeah, it's. I noticed some people recently in the airport that had it. Yeah, know, it's it it's really nice. easy uh, to carry it around, and once you're finished with a a novel, you can just order another one, and it's there in sure. ninety seconds or something like that. Yeah. So, um, I I do play golf. Um, when I have time, um, and you like to gardening, go, uh, yeah. the summer you're going down to the condo. That's been kind of nice. Yes, that's yes, we're do, looking do forward to going to the beach. Yeah, yes. that's nice. Um, Purdue tradition. Does one come to your mind? Do you have a tradition at Purdue? Sometimes people will say you know, Boilermaker Special or commencement or even the Lion Fountain. You know. Well, that's interesting. I, you know, I love Purdue. I absolutely love Purdue, and it has been so great to see it go from just being bricks and concrete in the 1960s to the beautiful campus that it is now. I love the clock tower, and I can see it from my office. It's my favorite thing on the campus. Um, the landscape that you just addressed has changed I, a lot. If the landscaping is amazing, and I know that uh, President Stephen Beering had a great deal to do with that. Um, including the bell tower. Including, yeah, I, I never know whether to say it's the bell tower or the clock tower. I always, I, I know that it matters, and I, and I. They usually refer but, to it as the bell tower. I think you hear that term more often. Than the bell term. tower. Okay. Yeah, more so, so the bell. So let's let's erase yeah, that let's part of it. But the but, men and people say they'll be driving in town. And say, oh, I see that clock and it's in a tower. So you, yeah, both there terms you go. Are, are yeah. appropriate. Yes, no. but it's it's um, one of my most favorite icons on the campus. Sure. Um, I love the the whole um, the beauty of the campus. 
the tradition, you know, we, we go to the football games. I, I love the, uh, the sound of the, the band and all, the, it, yeah, all, all, all of those things. Right. It's, it's just, I'm so proud of it. And I, so it's amazing to me to be a part of it. You know, no, I mean, and enjoy it at the same time. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Very yes. well said. Yeah. How about an outstanding event? Well, you can have so many people say, "Do I have, to have one?" I said, "No, you can have more than one." Some people do. There, you know, there have been some some times. Uh, well, winning that student research award from the National Reading Conference that was a very proud moment for me. Um, and another life-changing event was when I was invited to come here to get Reading Recovery started because that was an invitation to come, you know, not only to a Big Ten university, but to my alma mater. I mean, I I never imagined that anything like that would happen. Uh, The best day in my life was when my son was born. Those are kind of good. Let me yeah. ask you this. Uh, what was the campus like when you started in the 60s? Can you make, just for you research, science, this kind of helps the history. I mean, the campus is a lot different than it is today. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, that reminds me. I knew that I was going somewhere with yeah. my with the traditions. Right. You mentioned the fountain. Right. In the 60s, the fountain in front of Hubdi was... The low it, fountain, which the, is now over there. Right. Correct. Which that was there. my favorite fountain. I didn't like the the newer, modern-looking fountain when they put it in. And so I was so pleased when they put this fountain right, <laughs> in, in, front of my, right in front of my building. That So that is one of my favorite places yeah, on the is campus, nice. is that, the way, the way that fountain. Uh, the way it's structured and everything, it is nice. Yeah, right. it's beautiful. Yeah, and I have the opportunity to see it a lot because it's right in front of sure, my building. Exactly. So there's so many things that are are. But when so, in the '60s, you know, um, Discovery Park did not exist, so State Street was quite a bit different than it is today. Well, you know yeah. that's interesting. All of the, you know how they have the streets. Um, Waldron and all those where every two blocks they switch directions. It used to be you could just drive down all of those streets. Two ways. Two ways. Okay. You know, so it's so odd. used to be two ways. Yeah. Yeah. It's so odd. And and it used to be able to um, pull into the campus, drive all over, and park, you know, because everything was concrete. Um, Good point. It what you know they it, and the entrance it, would have been uh, one of the entrances was across was where uh, Northwestern and they had the parking there in what's now Engineering Mall. Absolutely. So so now, you know you can't drive in there. You can't <laughs> see that, but it's so beautiful the way it is now. Yeah, I know. Um, most of the campus was contained on this side of um, State Street. I mean, okay. it, it has grown so much then the on the other this, side. Grand Street in the 60s was the garage, because some of the people have told me that there used to be houses there at one time, along there. I, but that would have been before that. But I think that was before. I think that the Grant Street garage was, was Probably there. Probably built. Yeah. And the bookstore was, to, it was where The bookstore was there. Okay. Um, the Purdue West Shopping Center wasn't nearly as big as it is now. Okay. But, you know, my freshman year, I remember for sure, I can't remember about later on, but women could not wear pants in the union building. Students or any Women, students, girls. They had to wear skirts? Yes. You were a woman, a, a, a female student was, female was not to be, not wear pants. no, it was just not appropriate to wear pants in the union building. That's interesting. I hadn't heard that. Yeah, have you ever heard that before? No, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. How did, then it just sort of gradually came about? Well, you know, know that was the in. 60s finally right, okay. caught up with Purdue, you know. The 60s were happening other places right, before they got to Purdue, yeah. but then it went from, you know, needing to have a, to have a skirt on to blue jeans. Yeah, I but that's a good. Now, and in, in the in the dining halls, 
we had sit down meals okay. for dinner. Waiter served and you sit you down meals. I dinner. can't remember if we had to dress for dinner or not, but do they have? And they had a social. They have dances and things in the union. That's where they yes. would be. Okay. Uh -huh. And the, would your sorority have socials as well? The yes. Yes. Yeah. We um, we used to have a spring formal. I think. Mm -hmm. Do you have it yeah. on campus? Uh, in the building, probably in the union? Or could have been even in the I house? I think it might have been out at oh, it's on a other hotel place. or could something. You know, like at um, Howard Johnson's hotel sure. had, had a banquet yeah. room or something well, those like are that. Good, good observations. Yeah. That's really yeah. nice. Um, the reading recovery program, in your own words, and um, I'll leave anything I forgot to ask. Uh, closing is I'm leaving it in your hands. <laughs> Leave it in my yeah, hands. Yeah. Well, it was a life-changing event to say yes to getting started in, in reading recovery because for 19 years, you know, following that decision, it, it shaped my entire sure. professional life. I know that uh, I've had an impact on the lives of many children through my association with working with incredible teacher leaders who then train teachers but because of the hierarchical structure of trainer trains teacher leaders teacher leaders train teachers then each year that you know grows exponentially I, I've seen many children uh, go from struggling to smiling and um, despite whatever learning. has been happening in their home, once you see that they're proud of themselves when they can read, that has been uh, probably one of the most exciting professional things that's ever happened. I know that I'm getting ready to leave it and, and uh, take on a new challenge of teaching undergraduates uh, and graduate students, but um, not working with the Reading Recovery Program, but I'm really proud of my accomplishments related to that because I know that I've changed lives. For the for the long haul, too, forever, which is really nice. Yeah. You should be. Thank you very much. Thank well, you. Nicely Thank done. you so very much. Very 